So I think um, because we are such a diverse group today, um, it might sense um, to like uh, shed a few, uh, a little bit of light on what we might talk about when we say open science. And I think I'm just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna give a, uh, one of the many definitions that there are on what open science is. And um, as usual, I'm going to draw on my favorite definition, which we came up here at the Freie Universität Berlin in our working group, which is that open science aims at making all parts of the research cycle as open as possible for as many people as possible. And what's important about this definition is that this opening up does not mean open everything at any cost, but where it makes sense and where it is possible. What's also important when we use the term open science is that it's kind of misleading when we're talking English, because usually we don't just talk about the, the sciences as in the life sciences, but also about um, the humanities, social studies and um, um, and adjacent fields. And um, what's maybe also important um, to think about including is that uh, open science is, doesn't have to be understood as stuff that is like strictly connected to the research cycle, but also adjacent um, uh, uh, subjects. For example, teaching can be opened up within an um, open science framework, um, but also science communications, which leaves the realm of just academia or science, can be considered. Um, open science. Um, but of course this is very theoretical and I think the best way to dive in and also to, to, to get to know each other more is uh, to have a look what the three of you actually do when you do open science. So maybe we can have a little introductory round um, where you uh, tell us um, how you actually do open science, like which part of your own research practice is open and um, what does it entail for you. Um, does anybody feel like going first? Then I will pick Sabina. Thank you very much, Christina, and hello, everybody. It's great to be here. So, of course, um, I can talk about uh, some of the things I do in terms of open science, but um, most of what I do in my research is study uh, people who are engaged in open science practices. So I can, you know, I'm sure we're going to expand on this today, but the couple of things I wanted to highlight, which is also uh, what made me very interested in this discussion specifically, is the fact that I've been doing this for many years now. I started off uh, when I was a PhD student. I was already very interested. I founded a graduate open access journal already then. I was very interested in, in questions of how we disseminate um, in ways which are more equitable research outputs. And that's actually one of the reasons why I started to do a lot of work on data sharing and data infrastructures at that time. And already then, eh, as I was starting to document many of the efforts that were ongoing at that moment, it's about 20 years ago now, um, in genomic data sharing, I started to realize that there was a very serious gender issue eh, going on in that whole field, right? There were a lot of people engaged in what was um, generally seen as service to the research community. Um, you know, people that were acting as data curators, people that were acting as coordinators for research communities and facilitating the kind of conversation that would then lead to trust and to trustworthy exchange. And uh, there was an inordinate amount of women uh, to be found uh, in those roles, either women or people who, for whatever reason, couldn't, in fact, for personal reasons, because they were carers um, for any number of uh, background issues, couldn't actually have a full time job, for instance, in academia, it ended up being involved at a very high level uh, with a lot of expertise involved, but in this kind of more service oriented work. Mm -hmm. And that already alarmed me <laughs> quite a bit uh, when thinking about um, what are the, if you want, labor foundations of open science, um, because it alerted me to the fact that there were inequities baked into the system, partly because doing open science is still not the easiest thing to do, uh, given the way in which research is assessed and structured, um, that created these issues where people that were culturally seen to be more service oriented and um, would end up having uh, much more to do to facilitate open science than others. And of course, then in over the years, I've seen that issue, in fact, expanding rather than diminishing. Mm -hmm. And it started to become associated with me um, in my mind with the question of colonialism and how that then relates to how we're thinking about 
distribution of labor in open science between the north of the world, broadly conceived, and the south, um, with you know, quite a lot of one can say about um, who is in charge, for instance, of creating certain standards and disseminating them, and who ends up being conceptualized as a recipient or a user, right? And and what are the interactions uh, between these groups? So I think for me, these, these have been the reasons why I've gotten very interested in um, in these issues uh, when it comes to thinking about what openness means in research and how we're implementing that and the role that we're all playing in this. And so, of course, just to finish, um, what I'm doing in my own research, I'm, I'm very strongly committed in trying to make my work open access. Um, though that's also, of course, uh, there's lots of tensions there. Uh, I'm a oh, yeah. researcher based in the Global North. I'm in a pretty um, rich um, UK-based university. I have access to European funds, so I don't have problems uh, at the moment paying for author pay services when it comes to publishing but many of my colleagues and many of my collaborators have. So there are all sorts of issues around how we're dealing with open access at the moment and, and what we're doing as a group to try and confront those. And when it comes to data, um, I, I deal with a tremendous amount of very sensitive um, data. So transcripts, um, qualitative interviews, things like this. So we have a quite elaborate um, um, set of procedures to make sure that only uh, materials that are not sensitive and are not going to be harmful to people who are participating in our research uh, get put online. But of course, that has, um, is a trade-off. That means that actually the vast majority of our documentation does not get disseminated in any obvious standard uh, open data sense. So yeah, I'm sure hopefully there's enough for, for a start and yeah, we'll that... to the other panelists. <laughs> That is absolutely more than enough. Thank you so much. Um, I think this has also already opened like uh, a lot of the subjects um, that we can latch on to. And Sele, um, you already said that um, uh, uh, colonialism in science and anti-colonialism is something that you would like to, to, um, to expand on. Um, and maybe um, in that, uh, on that occasion also tell us a little bit about your um, current open practices. Thank you so much, and Sarina, thank you so much for your intervention as well. Um, I wanted to echo in two things that Sarina said right now about anti-colonialistic practices and trying to actually question yourself in regards of what do we understand by openness in the science for us in the you know, quote unquote global south. Um, the concept of open in science, it's a really European, North American kind of concept. Mm -hmm. So for us, we kind of see it, at least in my side of academia that I come from social sciences in, from a public university in Argentina, which is one of the most political countries in the entire region of Latin America. Um, what I want to say with this is that instead of, for us, instead of trying to conceptualize openness as we are opening the doors for the otherness to come into the academia. What we're trying to think about is like anti-colonial practices of knowledge production, distribution, and access. So we are not trying to keep the wall between something that's closed and something that's open, rather to have a dialogical experience with the people that we are working with. Because part of what we understand as anti-colonial practices of knowledge production um, and knowledge sharing as well. It's the mere fact of not being extractivists of people's wisdom and knowledge, right? So for us, I think it comes from, I don't know if you know this person, but his name is Thais Borda. He's US a Colombian sociologist who introduced the methodology core IAP, which in Spanish is Investigación, Acción, Participación, but in English it would be um, Research, Action, and Participation that talks a lot about that. And this comes from like the night, it was like, it was in the 80s or the 90s that he created this methodology. But what it's done is that we're starting to understand and starting to see how we can create this academic practices without trying to extract people's knowledge. And the other thing that I wanted to echo about is 
what Sabina was saying in regards of how we're taking care not only of the people that are working within academia, but at the same time, the people that we're researching with and for, and like the people our subjects of research, I'd say. And for that, we have been thinking of something around a framework of feminist ethics of care. Mm-hmm. It came from, we saw it first. I mean, we've, we've been seeing practices of ethic, feminist ethical care. I'm sorry, I'm, my English is super broken today. It's uh, fine, <laughs> don't worry. But what I wanted to say is that We've been seeing this coming from activists and feminists in the region, trying to understand self care practices and collective uh, practices of care as well. And now we're seeing it going to the academia and we're also seeing it going towards not only like the social and relational aspects of academia, but also on how we're treating the information that we're working with. For example, this is this, there's this woman called Fotopolunu and she talked about like, for example, practices of care within data within data science. I mean, it's something that goes and crosses over all of the different layers of what academia means to us, for example. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's Thank also you. like a, <clears throat> um, that's a, 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 another big uh, a, a next layer of things that we can add on. But I think it's also a great segue to Claudia's work um, because um, you mentioned that we're talking about the people who do the research and also the subjects of research. And I think that line of uh, between subject and object of research and participation is something that Claudia engages in. Um, so maybe Claudia, maybe you can just jump in and tell us a little bit about your practices of open science um, and um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Hello and uh, thank you for this great panel. Uh, That's really uh, an honor and I'm really happy that we can have this conversation. And um, yeah, I can very much relate to uh, what what both of you have said because I uh, began to be interested in questions of open science during my studies. and then carried this um, this over to my work, and I came from a background of um, participatory research. And there are, um, Selene, you have mentioned uh, the the participatory action research uh, or community based participatory research, um, and this is also what I encountered first. And then uh, I got to know that uh, in in Germany and in Europe at the time, uh, it was yeah. Oh, now it's already about ten years ago. Um, there was a new uh, a new concept um, coming up in research practice, but also in research policy um, that was citizen science. Um, and it was loosely linked to, to open science only at the time. And um, I engaged with that concept and worked at the Natural History Museum and this European Citizen Science Association, um, who started building a community around citizen science. Um, and um, I always found it interesting that also in the whole policy framework around open science and citizen science, um, it was very much driven by scientific institutions. Um, and there was somehow um, also an air of reinventing the wheel of what could this be now. And in my work, it has always been very important to um, remember <laughs> that there are a lot of participatory research practices existing in different kinds of sciences and also around the globe that have local contexts that are Uh, very important that we can draw so much from in terms of methodology, in terms of ethics. Um, And um, yeah, so I, um, while um, building this community, I have um, tried to open up these uh, discourses and make citizen science and people engaged in this field, um, uh, yeah, open possibilities to learn about what is already there and um, connect to communities that do this. And also I found it quite, um, um, yeah, crazy how uh, networked and international also our science policy and how we do science. It's very international. So that that, um, gives a chance, for example, there are many groups in Germany and I think around the world that do local history because it matters to their place, to their identity, to their communities. Um, But this is not a topic that um, could be uh, successful in international science because the research in history today has moved to other questions that are uh, that simply have no space for that. Um, so there, I think, is a little uh, a little bit a question of, of how this can be connected if we want to have excellent science but have participation. And then another issue that struck me um, was that science policy is also so biased towards uh, the global north 
um, so that whatever gets defined as open science and citizen science in Europe or in the US will have consequences to people around the globe. And so it is not actually not, uh, we cannot have these discussions just among people who are sent based in the scientific systems here. Um, so this was part of, so I'd say that open participatory research um, is one of the areas that I focus on. But then um, opening research organizations has been um, more the practical way of how I have tried to um, engage with um, yeah, addressing some of these issues and building communities that are that are um, more open so that we can have these discussions together. Yeah, I think for the moment. Um, I think we have now um, enough cards on the table um, that it might be a good point in time to look at the second term that is like in the um, in the middle of our discussion and that is the concept of intersectionality or intersectional feminism. So um, in case not everybody here um, is aware of what that term means, um, a very, very rough um, a description might be that um, intersectionality, uh, intersectionality acknowledges the fact that structures of discrimination and of privilege usually come in a set of dimensions that do intersect. So usually you do not just have one identity or um, one factor of your life, of your being in this world that makes you either subject to discrimination or makes you benefit from, from certain privileges. Like um, I'm a, a white, female in the global north with a high academic degree that comes from a working class family and these five things very much um, bring a whole set of privileges but also discriminations that I um, have faced in my life and um, this set will be very different for different individuals and I think intersectionality wants to um, uh, wants to acknowledge that um, at any time and when it comes to the connection with um, with science with research and with open science, that also means that if we just look at one of these um, dimensions, we will fail to see other things. So if we have one thing that seems to benefit science, then it might be that it only benefits male white scientists in the global north and we exclude others. So basically this is the, this is the interconnectedness of, of isu issues that, um, that we would like um, to, to look at today um, a little bit closer. And um, for um, for the next round, um, I would like to allow us um, to maybe um, be a little bit focusing on the on the negative sides and on the the. Um, the aspects of open science that we currently see that might be going wrong. I think, Sele, you said something that actually to me um, just now was a new concept, and maybe we can start there. Um, you said that the concept of opening up science itself is, uh, um, is a concept that only works if you speak from a um, privileged position of academia in the North, right? Is that, did I, did I understand that correctly? Maybe you can elaborate on this a little bit more because I think that's something we need to talk about. Yeah, yeah, you hit the nail. It's it. That's it. <laughs> but what we're seeing is that uh, somehow from this side of the world, from like these geographies and from these cultures, when we see concepts like open science and science itself, we're seeing it from like a really monolithic and rigid knowledge structure, right? So what we're trying to do or how it's being understood from these latitudes is that we are in this castle of knowledge. Do you hear me well? I'm sorry. I'm it's just fine. Yeah. There's a lot of noise. Okay. Great. Um, that we're sitting in this castle of knowledge and we're the ones that have enough privilege and power to let others in, right? And so that's what's being problematized right now, right here. And it's trying to understand like the different nuances that encompass what, but what doing science actually means. So a lot of the Avyayala or anti-colonial indigenous feminists here in Latin America are talking about is that 
a lot of the knowledge that's being produced from the territories and within the territories. It's knowledge that doesn't have to go through academia anymore. That that knowledge doesn't have to be validated, but something that has historically marginalized them. So I think that what we can do is try to understand those two different aspects of what we understand by science and by opening something. Yeah. I don't know if someone wants to, uh, if, if no, I can go on, I mean. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe just, just, uh, just, just let's take one more step. So, um, so that means that if we um, have a concept that puts um, opening up, um, for example, to uh, include marginalized communities, actually the act of opening up is an act of inclusion, uh, exclusion because it draws, draws the line in the first place, or does it, does it perpetuate exclusions that are already at play? That, does it create them or does it, does it um, deepen them? I don't them? think it creates more exclusion, mm -hmm. but it keeps continued, like, I don't know how to say this in English anymore, but like, it keeps, perpetuating the walls. Yeah. Like we're not saying that they don't, they can't come into our walls and to our castle, but we're saying that we're still going to be situated within the castle. Yeah. Like we're not going out. You're coming into our structures. You are coming into what we define, what science is, what academia is and what valuable knowledge is. Because if you're outside of our walls, that means that you're not validated, that your knowledge is not validated. I love the idea of research citizen, um, citizen research practices, because that gives a space to understand new ways of, I'm sorry, I just dropped my charger. It gives us, it gives us new way to understand what other people want to say about their very own trajectories and about their very own experiences. Yeah, but I'm not saying that open science, it's exclusionary, but I, what, what I want to say is that we need to problematize the fact that we're still on a rigid castle. Yeah, I think this sounds like a great point for, for Sabina, for you to join in. I mean, you, you studied what good science is. Um, and um, you thought a lot about um, how um, epistemic diversity is kind of like a precondition for proper open science. And I feel that that connects to what Sele just said. Um, can you maybe add on to that from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's many things one could say um, here, but I suppose um, one of the things that is interesting to me is that there is many um, initiatives that one could put under the rubric of open science, depending on, of course, how one uses terminology, which are not based um, in the global north, right? But I would completely agree with Sele that they tend to then be marginalized in some way at uh, the moment they sort of, even when they get recognized and sort of um, picked up in some of the activities that we do um, in Europe and in the States, especially. Um, so in, especially I'm thinking about open access and here I know that um, Christina also will have um, enormous expertise, much more than me, um, in thinking about how we are trying to, um, you know, not um, rework this open science castle around these very firm boundaries that are already been provided by commercial publishers by just ratifying things like transformative agreements, which are basically um, favoring people who are already in very well paid institutions, uh, right? And rather, I mean, many people who have been advising Plan S and, and other organizations in Europe trying to look at open access have been pointing to uh, South America as the real place where a lot of this work has been happening and has been happening in a way that really is much more sustainable um, much, I mean, it, it really does provide a, a wonderful example for what open access can be when you treat it as, as Sele said, in a way that's dialogical and collaborative, right? As a communication between different communities rather than having some sort of top-down structure where we can just fit in or attempt to fit in um, if we can. Um, I mean, it's, it's constantly fascinating to me that even in a situation like the open access one where it's very clear that there are role models and uh, there are a lot of voices saying well 
that's what we should be looking at. That's how we should be operating. There's still so many obstacles to try and frame what we're doing um, in these ways, right? Because I mean, this this system. Oh, so sorry, uh, this system is so has so many different components uh, that it's just very very hard to control <laughs> who is actually um, you know how how does one move? I'm so sorry. I don't know what is going on here, and um, um, what is yeah to control what is actually moving um, um, into our sphere, and and how do we move this course on open science so that we can look at better role models? Um, I don't know yeah. whether uh, Christina has something to say about this. I bet you do. Uh, um, um, maybe not better, but I think it's it's uh, the the point of that, um, especially the idea that South America does open access so well, um, is like, um, maybe Sally, you have uh, maybe a better perspective on this, but it's a myth that we've been telling each other um, uh, in Europe for a long time. Oh, they they do it so greatly. Let's just look at how they do it. But um, I talked to some um, Colombian library colleagues earlier this year, and they were like, yeah, sure, we have our open access journals, but none of our open access journals are actually um, in the big rankings. And if you want to participate in international and northern research, you still have to get into the, um, uh, the new or the newly established journals that have high article processing charges, etc. So while there are infrastructures, the same, by the way, is, is, is uh, true for um, Eastern Europe, where there are a lot of great um, open access infrastructures that are already um, like owned by universities, but they don't tie in well with this uh, structures of excellence, I don't know who of you three used the word excellence before, that are just their own little um, universe um, of who, who, is, who is in and, and who is out. Um, but um, I think it's important, um, Sabina, what you said, that um, in the process of creating infrastructures for open science, there is currently an awareness that we shouldn't repeat the mistakes um, that we made with open access um, by building stuff that is uh, that is expensive and that locks us in with um, um, with global uh, companies that are um, at the stock market and that are interested in their profit line much much more than in um, in actual research and knowledge production um, but I feel like um, Sabina from from your perspective of work um, this idea of um, epistemic diversity um, that you wrote about I would like to have that concept on the table um, because I feel like that plays very well into what Sele just said about which knowledge is actually valued and which processes of knowledge production actually make it um, on the on the global landscape. So, can you maybe tell us a little bit about what that concept entails for you? Of course, thank you. So, I think we're familiar with the idea of diversity. Certainly, people who are interested in this conversation. Uh, the reason for uh, people in my field to talk about epistemic diversity is to look specifically at types of diversity that have direct relevance for knowledge production and for anything to do with the use of knowledge and uh, interventions um, in society based on um, information and knowledge, particularly produced within scientific environments. And um, so the a reason to be very interested in that when uh, worrying about open science is the fact that um, there is a general worry one finds, I think, in many open science discussions about the fact that, um, you know, there is this pesky things called research cultures around and they stand in the way of actually opening things up, you know, because people are conservative, because they're operating on usually patriarchal, like, you know, you know, system that is uh, very stratified hierarchically and is very, very difficult to then think about having more horizontal communications in all of that. Now, that is all fine and we understand the motivations for be weary of certain ways of thinking about research cultures. Um, but the risk here is to um, throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, which is to actually forget that there's not only problems with privilege and unwarranted assumptions um, in existing research cultures around who should be speaking and who should be making decisions. There is also a set of methods and tools and ways of doing things which have been developed over hundreds of years in many cases, to deal with very particular problems under very particular settings. And um, so 
sometimes uh, my finding has been that uh, the push towards um, opening everything up tends to come with a certain high level of standardization, people really wanting to uh, try and make sure that we have the right formats, that we're all using the same um, you know, repositories, that we're all trying to do things similarly so that we can talk with each other. And that very often comes at the expense of recognizing the fact that in many situations, doing things in a way that looks a little bit peculiar, kind of a strange type of research culture, actually um, has very good reasons, scientific reasons, sometimes even social reasons for being so. And so worrying about epistemic diversity in that sense, why is it that the particular field insists on um, going to talk to people on the ground instead of just sending out a survey, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Like this kind of peculiarities of different research fields um, is actually a very good way to try and engage with what others may be in the discussion of open science and openness. Um, so what I'm trying to point out is that actually worrying and considering epistemic diversity becomes a very good starting point uh, to think about open science rather than necessarily being something that stands in the way of opening up things more, right? So I think we need to try and differentiate between try to improve uh, the fairness and the justice in our research systems, which is very urgent and very needed. But what does it mean to do that while at the same time taking account and in fact um, being somewhat respectful or at least trying to understand uh, why people in different fields in different parts of the world want to do things differently? Yeah. Um, yes, Claudia, I was just about to, to ask you for your, um, for your take on that. Um, yes, um, because um, I would uh, reiterate that because uh, I did a study uh, some time already ago on um, the data standards that are necessary for making the citizen science data or data in citizen science project more interoperable. And um, the goals are very often um, um, very laudable so that, for example, data on environmental monitoring that has been gathered in one place then can be better used for regulation. Um, and this is in many cases also what people want to do the monitoring. Um, however, that what I found is when this comes aligned to open science standards, then there will be standards in place and these standards um, very often, they are very, they are focused on data. But while when we are looking at participatory research as a, a men, a, like a conglomerate of different practices that has, that is very well founded in different research cultures, different disciplines, um, we see that it's much more about knowledge and that knowledge that we work on in the research process can have many different shapes. Or also, you know, we have um, people who work on open science hardware um, or who do uh, community meetings that, uh, that don't take that shape or community laboratories that do much more experimental science. And in all of these, they would not fit into those standards that are about exchanging opening data. So. On the one hand, I agree it's, re it's really important that we open up research data and we facilitate sharing and so it can also be um, um, more recept better received in context of application. But then I also totally agree that we need this epistemic diversity also regarding the forms, the, the outputs that are considered in, in open science. And I think this is what I've seen um, uh, a lot also when we just look at open science um, alternative metrics for uh, traditional research that is without participation, um, we see an opening to various formats, but still I think many things are falling um, are falling down from the table. And um, especially regarding participatory research, this is really um, a tragedy because th there is a lot of embodied knowledge, for example, or like let's say many of the, um, the practices of participatory research that are more empowering or that give a stronger power of decision to communities, to affected people or to people who are very far from academia usually. Um, particularly those practices are not so well streamlined to the institutional scientific research processes and then they do not find uh, a space there, they cannot get the funding or they are just not um, on, the, on the horizon anymore. And so I, I see really that there is this uh, danger of standardizing, standardizing open science as something that has very little space um, only for a certain type of, um, of activities. Um, and I think this is also a problem that I see with, uh, with academia um, that is perpetuated with open science. It is still, and here I think this links back to what uh, Sela said at the beginning, um, it is still very much centered on scientific institutions. 
And um, there is a lot of great work carried out by NGOs, by community groups, um, and somehow partnerships between those actors or at the city level. It's also not a traditional research actor um, because a lot of the areas of our lives today are becoming more based on science and we need to understand it, but we can also be part in, in producing some of it. But this is not part, usually, um, not part of what we understand as open science. And I think here is really a big uh, potential for making that framework um, broader and more accessible to other players as well. Yeah. Um, at this point, just for our round of panelists, because we are on screen, um, if you want to jump in, please let me know. Um, it's hard to read the small cues um, um, on the screen. So, um, Sele, Sabina, does uh, one of you, uh, the two of you want to follow up on this directly? Then, yeah. I mean, I yeah, suppose, um, I mean, many things one could say, of course, thank you very much, um, Claudia, for this. Um, I think one of the key issues here is um, how does one then uh, try and communicate with other groups, uh, right, in, 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 this, in this whole area? And I think that's where we keep stumbling uh, across problems uh, when we're trying to implement some of these issues. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things is that, of course, um, I'm not surprised at all you're finding these issues uh, when it comes to citizen science initiatives. Uh, these are pretty much the same kind of issues you find within the world of research uh, proper, like uh, professional research. Uh, there is a lot of problems in people trying to communicate to each other, their different data sets and which standards are going to be adopted to deal with those. Um, I mean, to me, at least, one of the interesting questions that seems to be, in a sense, complicating this, but I think it may help us to deal with some of these issues, is to think about what of this, which of these materials is responsible to share and with whom, uh, which I think, especially for environmental data, becomes a very, very big question, um, trying to basically go beyond the assumption that uh, one of the key and things that citizen science projects can do, uh, certainly in the environmental area, is to collect data and then make it available. But rather thinking about, okay, can we think of ways in which uh, this data, if released, could be even sometimes harmful to the communities that uh, we are documenting or may become so well linked with other types of data? And in light of that, uh, what kind of prospective uses of these materials can we envisage? And can we think about the prospective use of some of these materials as something that actually informs our openness practices? Um, rather than this idea of just sharing as much as possible, right? I mean, I, I know that this is a little bit of a shift, I think, in, in ways of conceptualizing open science, because even in the wonderful introduction that Christina gave, I mean, the idea is still openness as well. Let's try and share as much as we can, uh, mm -hmm. understanding the fact that there are going to be limits, right? And I have to say, <laughs> the more I work on this, the more skeptical I get, or even about that, um, kind of much more yeah. limited way of thinking about open science. I'd, I'd, I'd rather actually go away uh, from the idea of uh, openness as sharing, even. Um, yeah. But rather thinking about, okay, so what do we want to achieve uh, with scientific work? Um, what kind of information we may need to be able to get there? And where could we go to get that information and, and use that as a starting point uh, for some of these discussions, if you see what I mean, including, of course, uh, citizen participation and participatory practices that seem to be absolutely essential if you want to have, to make any inroad in questions of climate change or environmental action. Yeah. Yeah, just to flesh this out, just like a tiny little bit, um, what kind of um, data could be harmful. I had a great discussion with the open science activist and um, climate researcher Claudia Frick a few weeks back, and she pointed out the fact that um, weather data and climate information can have military value. Like if you know which way the wind blows through a city that can inform military tactics. And that's just a very easy example where sharing actually might might be a, a bad idea. And what I'm really excited about right now are, are two things in our discussion. And one is that the idea that not only um, the, the academic system as we look at it is informed by um, structures in society like, like patriarchy, like decision-making processes are, are 
structured in uh, in structures that we know from patriarchy or um, uh, hegemony, but also that they are embodied in practices, and that these practices themselves, which which are found in in methods, can contain these power structures, and they are not easily detangled um, or or even changed. And um, I think I would be interested in in Asile's perspective on that because uh, the idea that um, a method itself could be a colonial practice or even like it sounds like standardization can be a, 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 a power tool um, that um, that strengthens um, hegemonical um, structures or um, colonial structures um, do you have any thoughts around that or can you can you elaborate on th on that line of thought I think that's something that comes to mind in regards of standardizing data, for example. Um, okay, so for me, any feminist methodology is inherently collaborative, collaborative, right? So we need to have different perspective. We need to have different point of view. We don't necessarily need to be um, in agree in agreement with everyone else, but at least we have the plurality, pl plurality. I don't even know how to say it anymore in English. I think I can't even say it in Spanish right now. But so many plural voices, that's what I want to say, right? And in that sense, based on what I'm doing right now, for example, on my research on open geospatial data from a feminist perspective, if you look at the the basic standards that come from the Open Geospatial Consortium, there, I'm just going to give random numbers, but it's around this. But for example, from 68 members that are voting, how you're going to create those standards only for our women. And those women are from the global north. So it comes, it's creating the standards, it's not the problem for me. But the process of creating those standards, it's what needs to be revised. Mm. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm. And a little bit about what I was also asking in the chat earlier, when we're talking about, for example, epistemic diversity, are we looking before to epistemic justices, practices as well? Like, who are we letting in to say what they have to say about this? What do you what do you mean by epistemic justices? I don't know if you know the terms epistemic injustice from Miranda Fricker that was later on. Um, I'm gonna put it here in the chat for a second. Epistemic injustice. So she basically says that there are different ways in which you can understand epistemical issues from an justice or injustice, like a and there is some between justice and injustice perspective. And she divides them into testimonial and hermeneutical injustices. And that comes to the fact to say that in basing on intersectionality as well, um, who's the people that are letting the others be able to say what they know or what they want to say. So it could be from any kind of example of a woman being I don't know, being in a car accident, crashing a man's car, and the police person, whoever comes, only asks the man what actually happened based on the fact that the bias that women always are always bad drivers. So why do we want to ask her? She was probably the one that caused the accident. Mm -hmm. So that's, an epi that's a dermatological injustice or a testimonial injustice, for example. So it's understanding who has the power and the privilege to let the other one, to let the others tell their stories. Mm. Okay. And that's for me, like, that's something I don't think, I think it's something that keeps going on in my mind in terms of trying to understand, like, how we're standardizing our data practices. And that's something that I also saw doing the Frictionless Data Fellowship with the Open Knowledge Foundation and so on and so on, that those standards, at least, like, for example, in geospatial data, ontological standards on how we're going to structure data are being determined by a really small group of people. Yeah, Claudia.
Yeah, I'd link to uh, I'd like to link up with this because it really concerns uh, uh, the core of my interest right now that I've come through over the years um, um, of somehow linking all uh, these open science and citizen science. Um, I also find that who's building the standards, but also um, um, yeah, who, who, how are we coming together to work together? Um, and this is also where I try to uh, yeah draw on the ideas that I get from feminist reading from other groups who are organizing and doing some work. And I've just put some uh, some examples in the chat that uh, usually they draw on time, some kind of feminism, um, but for the way that they organize collectively. Um, to then base their research practices on, or maybe also their uh, advocacy practices. Um, and this is something, for example, I mean, just to give a, a concrete example where I, I think it's very valuable what we are doing, but it's also always a little bit of struggle, um, is that um, at this European Citizen Science Association, uh, we have established a working group, and that is together with the Living Knowledge Network that links uh, science shops, so this is like an older form of of linking civil society and, and um, research institutions together. They are brokers that really work with local level NGOs and try to make research for uh, questions from society uh, somehow answered and find students and researchers to work with them. And they have a different methodology than citizen science. Citizen science is usually much more data driven. Um, so we like try to link people from these two traditions to talk with each other and do some method development or also just an exchange of how everybody works. But what I would like to point out is that um, in the way that we organize research today, it is very much project driven. Um, so also in this field of citizen science, it is not you do not have a, a certain sustainability and then you have people that come and go and in projects, the schedules are very much um, um, squeeze together, then particularly if you work with communities, it doesn't give you much space. So even having a standing working group for, I don't know, four or five years now for people to come and also then to create a space in which we would like to interact, uh, to make it a little bit like a community and not only like a, a policy influencing hub, you know, um, this is already something. And then through this working group, we have organized several activities along the years. Um, and one was to bring uh, people together from different paradigms even more and not to open up these discussions. But I must say, um, so it works well to have that space, but also like this reaching out and really developing methods. That has not really happened because then I find it's more on a conceptual level that you think, ah, uh, they are all some or we are all in a space of participatory methods. So we can learn from each other, but actually it doesn't happen because there are many different silos and everybody also has their communities, their research disciplines, uh, their local backgrounds. And between that, it's really not so easy to facilitate an exchange because maybe it's, it's simply not needed, you know? Then I also think that, okay, it, it's fine if it fails, if there is no demand, then, then it's okay. But this is somehow also a limit where I get to this, um, this open, more open organizing practices um, but yeah, sometimes I find that communities or people or their contexts are so different or also politically, um, then we, 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 yeah, we don't have so much to, to continue working together. Ah, yeah, but I wanted to call out, so like, because I'm interested in this open organizing and I think that in open science, there are many new ways of, of doing that. If anybody has, uh, has some examples or anything. Um, also from all the people that are that are there with us. Um, I just lo love to look, take a look. If, if not, don't worry. But yeah, just I'd be interested in that. Yeah, keep keep sending the um, the examples. Um, maybe this is a good point in time to try to pivot our perspective a little bit more towards um, the positive. Um, Claudia, you just said that basically the the vision and the practices didn't line up. Um, and that leaves you at a point where you're not sure where to go. Should you adjust the goal um, if you can't actually establish the methods that this community ideally would have produced? So what is the next step to turn this around positively? Do you use these communities for something else? Do you not even start creating these communities in the first place? Um, is, there, is there a way to, to think this forward where we have more openness, more community, but also a positive contribution to, to, to research or science. Do you see a future here? 
Oh, it's difficult. But um, for this particular space, so like this working group, and uh, Petra is also here. Uh, she's a co-chair of this working group. Um, so for this particular space, that is like my little hub for doing some kind of activities and linking up with people. Um, at the moment, I think what is valuable in itself is to see what is possible there and what is not possible, and just try to invest the energy that I have into um, maintaining that space. So maintaining a space that people know that if they're interested in a certain kind of exchange, then they can go there, they can present their work or learn from others and try to make this as accessible and as um, bottom up organized as possible. Um, and beyond that, um, I must say, I'm looking at some, some, um, basically I took my, I took my, some time out for writing the PhD in order for myself also to read on some new stuff and uh, make my mind up um, to get a better view of how this research system actually functions to understand, okay, what could be some next steps that, to work on, but that's still very much in the middle and very much in my head. So um, yeah, I'm, yeah, new things need to come out of that. But I'd like to follow up on this idea of building more open and interstitial organizations or forms of organizing to mobilize stuff. Yeah, if we keep in this in this line of thinking, um, we've we've looked a lot of uh, we looked a lot right now at um, where the where the problems lie or where um, opening up perpetuates um, existing. Um, injustices basically um from the work that you have done and uh, maybe starting with sabina can we also concretely say that certain open practices that are already there or that are on the horizon about to come um, we can actually see that some issues that academia has as a system or um, the castle that Sele referenced earlier, um, that we can mitigate those or even solve some of the problems and actually made it, make it better through open practices? Is there some things that work structurally, systemically through openness? So thanks, Christina. Gosh, there's, there's many things one could say to this too. Um, I suppose I was thinking about the work that we've been doing on these um, uh, types of communities called communities of practice. Um, within the organizations like the Research Data Alliance and um, some other organizations, particularly in relation to the plant and agricultural space. And that, I think, has been a very interesting um, learning moment for many of the people involved, this idea that actually we can uh, put together data scientists, uh, plant researchers, uh, people who are working in breeding and um, local farming communities, and have discussions around how we're shaping data systems in a way that actually everybody may benefit. Um, I mean, one of the things that that um, experience shows is that this is a very hard exercise. It does require a lot of commitment from everybody involved. And it's sometimes very hard to explain to the various participants why they should be committed uh, to something like this, especially in the longer term. Uh, right, so I mean, it's easier when some of these examples of, of things that have worked well um, are around, uh, but it's a bit more difficult to do uh, when there is no obvious role model uh, for what this could look like. Yeah. But I think this gives me always a uh, reason to hope that if we really think about um, open practices as grounded on this kind of intercommunity, um, iterative, regular, um, interactions where there's different accountabilities, different roles assigned to people. Um, you can't really think that busy farmers will be taking on work that pertains to setting up a knowledge system and vice versa. Um, but you do try and construct venues where feedback can constantly be given and mm -hmm. taken into account. Um, I think these are situations which we've had and, and a lot of the technologies we have at the moment really help in that respect um, because you know it's much easier to shift a digital system than to system, shift a physical one. Uh, it's possible to use um, uh, digital technologies to try and provide work across different languages, for instance, or provide um, different ways of presenting uh, the same method or insert many different methods that people may like to use or names, uh, for instance, for um, for species or plants that they're interested in, uh, depending on which culture and which um, in which conversation one is looking at. So there's all of these things that one can do very effectively. Um, I think um, 
there are challenges, of course, in how you, I mean, as, as Claudia was saying, how do you maintain both the level of engagement, but also just those exercises in the first place. Uh, they are intensive, uh, both in terms of the commitment requirement, uh, the fact that there's very few incentives to participate in these things. Um, you know, they're not usually the primary preoccupation of the people that are involved in, in having those conversations. So, um, and of course, the funding tends to be always short term for this. So that's uh, one constant challenge. Uh, the other challenge, I think, is to think about the much broader context we're operating in. Right. So I think there's lots and lots of examples of wonderful uh, open science or open organizational initiatives at the local level. Uh, but then the question needs to be posed. Um, how are the resources and materials used that are actually being put out by these communities? Right. And and I mean, certainly in the plant agricultural sphere, which which I look at uh, pretty closely in my work, there are several examples of this not going quite as well as you would hope, um, mm -hmm. where there's been historically so many um, instances of um, different industries or governments uh, picking up some of the data or resources being uh, developed by particular communities and almost turning it against them. Um, I mean, this is something that is being discussed now by the United Nations, by many of these big orga organizations, but it's somewhat hard to know what to do about that and, and how to block those kind of potentially problematic usages um, mm -hmm. once you have um, your work out there. So I think the big challenge for me at the moment in, in these kinds of um, interactions and in my work uh, of the participatory kind is finding ways to maintain space for bottom-up governance uh, once you actually have uh, resources being made available to others, right? How do you maintain that? Uh, what kind of compensation or benefits do you assign to people who have originally uh, produced the materials? But most importantly, how do you make sure that future uses don't damage them, uh, which is, I think, the much more problematic issue. So what would the bottom-up governance structure in knowledge production look like? So um, one of the examples we've brought in a report for the um, FAO, for the Food and Agriculture Organization, not that long ago uh, on this, uh, there are several examples of situations where, uh, for instance, uh, members of particular farming communities or breeding communities uh, become better acquainted with um, the ways in which a particular data system for agriculture is set up. And um, an agreement is made that representatives of those communities will, in fact, not just uh, provide information, but participate in the governance of, of the data resource, um, how it's been set up, what kind of standards are being used, um, you know, like how it's being fed to other systems. Um, so I think that is a very, very encouraging uh, situation, is, is the kind of thing that we want, really. Where it becomes, uh, of course, as always, uh, rather uh, challenging is at this boundary between public and private research. Yes. Um, because this is where it's just very hard um, to get a sense of what, what type of openness, what type of transparency could inform discussions around this. Uh, of course, you know, nobody is particularly, well, I mean, I suppose some, but um, I don't think it's necessary to require that private entities are fully transparent about what they're doing. I mean, uh, that probably is never really an idea yeah. <laughs> like that's particularly useful for anybody. But um, how does one um, have a sense and can, you know, assess or even monitor what is going on when uh, very big corporations are absorbing a lot of data, materials and methods from uh, publicly produced research and um, using it for their own purposes to kind of uh, develop particular products which are then sold back to the public. Yeah. And that is, uh, that is a really difficult nut to crack uh, yeah. because there seems to be a situation where you need some sort of regulation uh, actually intervening. Uh, but otherwise, it's very hard to naturally think about um, what a sort of participative governance model could be, uh, given yeah. the world we're living in at the moment. Yeah, I think also this point of the the um, um, the public and the the private sector in using um, the data that is produced in these circumstances is a super important point. Um, 
uh, when we talk about um, the limits of open science, um, um, there usually uh, starts a conversation that sometimes about there are good reasons against open science and there are bad reasons against open science. And financial profitability for some is a bad reason to close science, and for some reason it's a good re for some people it's a good reason um, if there's a commercial benefit at the end. So I guess th then there would be a discussion about capitalism, which maybe um, we do next time. Um, uh, uh, unless we want to center it right now. I would like to hand over to Sele again because um, I would be interested in seeing A, whether your field of research um, where it's about geospatial um, uh, data, um, if there's any connections to, to the agricultural world that um, Sabina just outlined, but also again the question, do you see any open practices that ap actively help to mitigate or maybe even solve the problems that we have with power structures in academia? Right now in regards of the first question if it's connected to our cultural um, services or whatever that yes a lot of people are working in anything that has to do with land use cover environmental geographic data and so on um i'm not close to that to that sector of my field also because i'm not a geographer just wanted to say that i'm studied my bachelor's in communications, master's in communication, PhD in communications. Okay. I'm just researching um, digital cartography and, fem and feminism. Um, but what I've been seeing is that de siloing the disciplines has helped people understand how they want to share better what they're producing in the sense of, for example, if you see a community of practice such as OpenStreetMap, which has around 9 million users and around 2 million contributors to, to this geographic um, database, Open Collective Geographic Database, you're seeing more and more people from academia coming towards the community and starting to share what they're doing with the work that we're doing as a, as, as a volunteer community or movement that produces this data and how the academy is using it and how they're bringing it back, how they're bringing back the discussion to the community. We have different, for example, um, conferences from the community. It's, it's called State of the Map. We have a national, local, regional, and international. And for the past three or four years, I think, or three years, we created an academic committee to start sharing what's being produced from academia based on activism, activist practices such as this. And to my earlier point about understanding like how it's not just one discipline, but how it combines with other forms of knowledge and how it combines with other themes, topics, or or for example, me doing, coming from social communications, doing work around geospatial data, working with activists and at the same time working with um, academia. It's, it kind of opens up a little bit more of what I was trying to say earlier that we don't necessarily need to go to the academia to be able to share the knowledge that's being produced there, but we're also co-producing it from our activist practices and from our communities of practice. Yeah. And there's the, the interdisciplinary part of it, I find it super important because data, data science is not just data science. The basic units of knowledge, the points of interest in the map, for example, they come from subjective perspectives of the people who are producing it from their different fields, from their different perspectives, from their different lived experiences. And all of that is combined into something that's called data science but behind that there's people that are that have their own biases that have their own perspectives of the world and the more you have other perspectives there and and the data it's not just data right like it looks at demographic data it looks at environmental data it looks at whatever data music data i don't know you know like it could be anything so data is not just data so for me, the interdisciplinary part of it, it's pretty important to actually think about 
reproducing, distributing, and having more access to more knowledge. Yeah. Claudia, Sabina, do you want to follow up on that? Uh, I, I um, cannot directly, but I have three things that give me hope that I could point out, if that is helpful at the Oh, stage. yes, please. We like because hope. More, more direct uh, connecting uh, to what Taylor just said, then maybe if I could skip that. No, go ahead, I think. Okay, so yeah, I see. I think we should be mindful that what we've discussed now, I think with the standards is very much pointing to two things that one is um, if we open up new spaces with this open science now, then we will find a reproduction of old biases and old problems. Yeah. And I also think that we are seeing new closings and problems and biases that are developing there. Um, but still, I must say, I think that it's also really exciting that these things are happening, that we are having this conversation, bringing these two topics together um, and that all of these other communities exist that we can work in and work with and research on and with. Um, so I think there's also many things happening. And for me, this is, I don't know, but I see it as like spaces for negotiations of meaning of uh, how do we want to see the world? How could it be different? These are um, opening and also new people coming into positions where they can actually um, make a change and uh, have an impact. Um, and they're bringing interesting, um, interesting concepts and ways of working. And um, I, I don't know, but um, I've, I've uh, three things that I, I will, for, for, I don't know, I, they give me hope. And uh, one is a very macro level thing that um, UNESCO last year has adopted a recommendation um, on open science. So this is like an international instrument that UNESCO, as powerful as it still may be, but I think for nation states, um, it has it has a lever. Um, and they recommend uh, every state on the world to look at open science and what can they do in their countries to um, foster open science and there are many dimensions to it participatory research is one but then there are of course uh, all the others that are usually more central um, so i think for communities to leverage that to link to that and to further push their agendas this is at least something very high level um, then on the on the medium level i don't know uh, regarding organizations I really believe that there is a potential for um, public research um, institutions and I uh, like museums because I work there, but also libraries because they're community places, or at least they can be. Um, and somehow I think through the whole becoming more digital, they're reinventing themselves a little bit and have to see that what their place is. And I see at least some um, turning to um, being more public um, and more participatory places. Um, um, and I think this is something that I would like to engage with more and, and see happening more and, and see what happens there. And then maybe um, on a very micro level, um, what through my research now I've become uh, familiar with, I got to know, um, is also I think a very feminist thing is a peer-to-peer -peer support groups mm. for critical emancipatory research. And I really learned that this is something, I did not have that in my previous working experience um, for just having two, three, four, five people that you met that are working on a similar topic and you have regular meeting when, when, when it is possible and meaningful for everybody, but to come together and, and discuss and support each other in the work that we're doing to get back these, this energy that, I don't know, I, I know it from big conferences and you refill this energy of, uh, no, why are you are doing this? But I found that um, having these smaller groups that, that somehow keep it going and also be there for each other when this whole struggle gets a little overwhelming. This is something that, um, yeah, I try to tell every, everybody about it because I found it really fascinating on a very tangible level um, in my work um, that this is definitely something um, great. So, so, so much to my hopeful. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting that you just outlined like basically three tiers of um, communication, cooperation and sharing, right? How it can happen on the interpersonal level, on the institutional level, and then on the nation state level, how once we have um, um, connections in place that form communities of any kind on these three levels, it's, it can work out. Um, Sile and Sabina, do you want to add on to these um, hopeful, to this hopeful triple? Um, things maybe that, that you look forward to or that, that are um, positive aspects of the um, feminist open science future um, that we're working towards? 
I, I wanted to, oh, okay, if you want to go, sorry, no, no, but I wanted just to follow up on something that yeah, Paul said at the end about the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, something that we've done on GeoChicas in this um, group that we have of women and cis and transgender women mappers in OpenStreetMap. It's something that we do every conference that's called GeoChicas Takes. So if the conference is in, we did one in Budapest, it was GeoChicas Takes Budapest, GeoChicas Takes Seattle, blah, 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 and so on. And what we do there is like a pre-event to support all of the women that participate in that event to double check their presentations, for them to network with each other. Most of them, because it's such a masculinized technological geospatial space, most of them are by themselves or with groups of lots of men and they're the only women or they don't know anyone or this is their first time in a conference. So what we do is that we create this safe space where I don't know, we buy them like a free beer and some snacks at the bar. But what we try to do is that we try to create those like ties, like the communities can only exist like through the ties and relations that we have, with, you know, like a community, it's not necessarily a network and the network is not necessarily a community. Like we have a shared set, a shared set of values and different relations. And for us, this is something that has helped a lot for the for people to feel supported in this more structured spaces that are conferences um, that are not particularly like really prone to support women being there, you know, because we in a lot of the things that we've seen, and this is not like the super hopeful part of it, but when they come and ask us to participate in panels to talk about like because we're the only women there we're never talking about our projects but we're talking about the situation of women within academia or within the community so we're always talking about the demographics on gender like the challenges for women for racialized people for you know and to be able to have these spaces to support others to present their projects rather than to present the problems of the community i think it's super hopeful <laughs> gives me hope at least a little bit and that's also a great practice to adopt in other communities right because i bet these structures exist um, in very many um, research communities whether it being women that are excluded um, or other groups that would um, do well with a snack and a beer the night before the conference to to uh, start creating a community yeah that sounds hopeful. Sabina, what about you? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, absolutely echoing what um, Claudia and Sil have already said, uh, I think this question around mentorship, what that means on the ground, yeah. and how do we value that, generally speaking, within research systems and beyond, is really crucial. Um, so I think what we're finding all the time, of course, is that there are uh, opportunities all the time emerging, which indeed also fills me with hope, um, of mentorship networks at a very local level within you know, your own institution with, with uh, communities of people that you're engaging with um, that can be extremely effective and at the same time a, a way of conceptualizing knowledge production that is completely alien to that right where that set of production mode of knowledge doesn't quite seem to uh, have mentorship as part of that i mean i think for me that's one of the main reasons to be involved in open science is the idea of shifting the way we understand research so that mentorship relations, for instance, become absolutely crucial, become the center uh, for how we're thinking about uh, what we are doing. And, you know, I mean, in the last three years, I ended up doing a lot of research on COVID-19 and what was happening in terms of data sharing and knowledge production there. And it was absolutely clear with all the work and all the communities that I engage with um, that where there was a quick and effective response uh, to the pandemic, was in places which already had very solid um, community relationships and in fact, uh, mentorship connections between people working at different institutions. And that really uh, on the ground in a situation of emergency made all the difference. But of course, that's not what we are told all the time. We are told, no, oh, no, no. The important thing is that we put all these materials online so that everything is highly standardized. We can immediately sort of somebody can go in and just, you know, do a big sweep and and produce claims. But that's actually not really how science functions. It's never really functional like that. I don't quite particularly see this changing in the era of AI. So I think that's already is such an important thing to keep very close. <laughs> uh, the fact that um, 
actually recognizing, rewarding um, these networks of mentorship and what we are passing on mm. to each other, both in an effective sense and, and in, in terms of skills and ability to cope with different situations is really important. The other thing that Claudia said that I thought was um, really fantastic and I also completely agree is the fact that this whole open science debate really is putting some public institutions who have, in fact, some accountability uh, to being open in some ways, uh, really at the center of the debate in a way that we haven't seen in a little while in, in, in research, uh, in academic research, certainly. I mean, I think there's been a point, you know, 10 years ago, I think, where people were already thinking about the fact that libraries were obsolete, right? Well, everything is online. We don't really need to have this group of people who specializes in knowledge system and supporting uh, people who are trying to do research. And now I have a feeling that this discourse has really gone away. I mean, we, we've started to recognize so strongly that the expertise in libraries is incredibly precious and it really does bring, it has this capacity of bringing in different communities across disciplines in a transdisciplinary way uh, that is really precious. And museums, I think, very much uh, going in that direction also. I mean, of course, that then depends on each institution how they want to play with that. But I think that's a hugely hopeful, hopeful note. Uh, the fact that we now have some of these institutions that in fact can nudge the universities rather than the other way down uh, to, to try and do work in the right way, bringing in more audiences and being more attentive to, um, you know, what are the implications of some of the work that has been done. Yeah, that ties in very nicely to your opening statement, actually, when you talked about how the um, the data curators um, tend to be the people who don't do not do the main research and who get um, less um, less credit and less recognition for their work. But um, I would also agree that there currently is a shift in recognizing these kind of works. And um, if I can add one of my own hopes that are connected to open science is actually the um, the um, acknowledgement of more types of work within the research field that we're already seeing, who gets credited, um, who is um, not just on the author list, but basically, um, uh, I don't know, the difference between a theater play and a movie that you actually see the hundreds and hundreds of people who were involved in creating that, that data. So we don't have hundreds and hundreds of people here, but um, still there are um, a few people in the virtual room that haven't participated in the discussion at this point. By the way, I'm completely amazed at, at, at your multitasking um, abilities to put like a whole system of notes on the conversation that we're having while we're having the conversation. But of course, I would um, reiterate the invitation to um, the participants um, that we haven't seen or heard so far to um, add their questions in the chat. We still have some time, so if you have specific questions that tie into the discussion we had, now is a great time to um, put it in the chat or even um, raise your hand so, so we, can, um, we can talk to each other. So if you have um, questions, now is a good time, um, now is a really good time to ask them. Um, yeah. I'm just going through my um, notes for a moment. Um, aha, there's a, a question in the chat, and that is, um, how do you see the public library's role in open science? So not academic libraries, but the public library. Um, uh, let's start um, with that with that question. I have the feeling that um, Claudia has a lot to say on that, but I don't want to assume. So who who wants to go first? I can just say a very small thing on it. Yeah, um, because uh, adults might actually um, have more knowledge on that. But I'm familiar with uh, a movement through the field of citizen science that some people have started to collaborate with libraries. Um, in the cities, and um, there is some something in um, Arizona in the US and in Barcelona, and I think also in some German cities now, um, that citizen science projects, they meet at the libraries, but also some of these projects, they have, uh, for example, tools for uh, doing the monitoring. And so some libraries have become also, um, you can go there and you can just uh, lend the tools. 
and maybe have some activities around it, maybe some training activities as well. And this is what I found, um, yeah, what I found interesting. But uh, of course, I can imagine many more things, but also I have never worked for a library. So probably I'm just, you know, making things up and need to know uh, much more about this. And I'm sure you, you will also know a whole ton about uh, where things are heading there. Um, I mean, one interesting uh, thing that I can add from the academic library perspective is that um, for the longest time there was, or I mean, there actually still is like a divide between academic libraries and public libraries. The training paths are a little different. There's not a super easy crossing over. And of course, once you are an academic librarian that maybe even has a PhD themselves, it's like different paths. But what we see right now is that when we come to organizing communities. We work t more closely together and academic libraries look at public libraries in order to learn more about community building because they're so much better at it um, than we are. And I find that super interesting. And um, they are, when we talk about the way, um, not example, what topics we work on, but how we work, how do we engage with communities, but also with each other, um, there are much more overlaps than there used to be um, a few years ago. So um, that, that would be my, my perspective on this, that the public libraries are so much better at opening up um, because the academic library, of course, also still has this idea of maintaining the castle, uh, silly. I'm just going to keep using that. Um, um, that is about also creating differences rather than, than equalizing. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I could also add, um, you know, I mean, I'm also pretty aware of the fact that it's not always easy to get public libraries to work with university libraries for all the reasons that Christina was pointing to. But I think, I mean, certainly our group is doing a lot of events at the local public library. And we work very closely with them precisely because it's such a wonderful venue for us to sort of bring uh, some of the work that we are doing and, and engage in discussion with different members of the community that are using the library. And I think that hopefully, I mean, somehow will generate a kind of more triangle <laughs> type uh, relationship. I mean, because I have a sense that uh, many researchers are looking at public libraries at the moment as places where, in fact, uh, one can hold activities which go beyond just you know, engagement in the sense that you go there and you give a little talk or a chat about what you're doing in the style of a science cafe, but actually you can have longer running projects um, where you engage people in, for instance, forms of citizen science. So, yeah, I mean, the, the space there is very promising. Sally, mm. do you also have a take on um, public libraries in open science? I actually don't, but I was sharing the projects that we do have in the Wikimedia movement and the community. But that's basically all I can say about that. Yeah. You haven't mentioned the role of, of the Wikimedia Foundation at all today. Um, I think a lot, lots of us have ties to um, one chapter or another of Wikimedia. Do you want to uh, maybe add a little bit how, how the Wikimedia Foundation ties into our conversation? The thing, though, is that I cannot be representing the Wikimedia Foundation right now. Um, I'm okay. here as me. <laughs> But for those who know the Wikimedia Foundation, and for those who don't, that is the Wikimedia Foundation is a nonprofit that gives support, um, legal, financial, and technological support to the Wikimedia movement that encompasses projects such as Wikipedia, Wikidata, um, Wikilibrary, Wiki. I, we have seven projects and many others Wikimedia Enterprise, Wikimedia Abstract, and so on. Um, I work there as a global di um, diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist. And most of the work that I'm doing currently right now, it's, it's mandate. It's more internal rather than external with the community and in our projects. So, so yeah, <laughs> that, and I cannot, like, I cannot speak on behalf of the foundation right now. I mean, obviously not, but, but maybe you have insights in, in how it ties, but no pressure. Like, um, I mean, everything, um, uh, that a lot of people see, for example, from a German perspective, particularly on Wikipedia, um, is that's a very male tech dominated um, community and that um, the, um, the people at Wikimedia um, basically uh, need to try to diversify the community actively because you, if you just let it run by itself, it will not diversify. It actually takes work um, to create that openness, right? 
I mean, that's something that's that's happening in most of the open source communities at the moment. That's why, for example, GeoChicas exists in the open stream map community. That's why wiki feministas exist in the Wikimedia community. That's why Django girls, Pi ladies, our ladies, and so on and so on exist in this community. We're all facing the same challenges inserted in really masculinized tech spaces. And for example, part of that part of what my research is about in regards to open geospatial data with OpenStreetMap is the fact that these communities perceive the production of this kind of knowledge as objective because it's technical, like it's a tech it's it's a technical kind of can you hear me? There's like a lot of Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Great. Um, because it's a lot of technical as there are a lot of technical aspects behind that. So, for example, stating that maps are objectives or that an encyclopedia, such as Wikipedia, can be objective. For me, those are the kind of conversations that we had 25 years ago, 30 years ago. So, those are the same challenges that are currently and still happening, and they're prompt to keep happening as well. Um, if we don't have more groups such as this ones. Yeah. But yeah. Thanks. Like the scientific way of producing knowledge in these communities about how everything has to be neutral and objective is the feminist side of it is making everything political. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I think um, the the uh, reconceptualization of objectivity is something that also could have happened 30 years ago and has been in the making for a long time. But for some reason, um, it, it doesn't arrive in all the communities um, or more networks. Um, it doesn't arrive in all the networks because, of course, maintaining a certain grandeur of objectivity um, benefits the people who have benefited from it in the past and might not so willing uh, be so willing to to give it up um, yeah I don't see any further questions um, from the audience is anybody um, out there who also has a question that they would like to pose that would be this would be a good moment Otherwise, um, I'll maybe take a look um, at, uh, at the three of you, uh, Claudia, Celia, Sabina. Do you have anything um, to add after us 90 minutes of talking um, about um, uh, open science and um, different aspects of intersectional feminism? Um, anything new that you learned or that you would like to underscore three times um, before we part ways? You know, one thing I would love to ask um, Sela and Claudia is sure. maybe more specifically um, whether intersectional feminist work is really informed or is informing specifically concretely uh, some of the things that you're involved in at the moment. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to hear if that's the case. Yeah. Claudia, Sela, what do you say? Claudia, do you want to start? You're so polite, both of you, all of you. Claudia, please. Okay. Um, well, for me, it's really this... Um, I try to translate these concepts into so how I work with other people. So if I get to a position to create a space or convene a discussion or a group or something like this, I really try to take a look beforehand and also get feedback beforehand how um, oh um, how how we we are we are um, what environment we are creating and how we can um, link this with reflections on different kinds of power hierarchies on um, yeah overlapping ways of discrimination how can yeah we just um, try to to do this better and then having uh, feedback loops and da, da 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 so really like my practice of organizing has been shaped in a constant dialogue with the stuff that I read or people I talk to that have uh, uh, um, such a feminist and intersectional feminist background. Um, and yeah, and then I guess it's questions I try to ask. So there's uh, there's this book by Kübra Gümse, which is a German uh, scholar. And she, for example, she, she has written a beautiful book about 
discrimination and language that also, yeah, you can give it to many people and they can easier understand some of these uh, highly complicated concepts. Um, and so I use her writing in my work whenever I give a presentation to, to ask some questions. And I hope that they stick with other people because she formulates this in such a beautiful way. Um, or a recent thing is like to taking this uh, feminist practice of zine making, of creating little outlets for, or not little, but um, non-formal uh, outlets for gathering knowledge and also sharing it. Um, so I, uh, we did a zine making workshop at one of these conferences and, and uh, did it as a pre-conference workshop and gathered what people were thinking about empowerment, inclusiveness, equity. What was what um, are they bothering with? Um, what experiences do they have? And I'm, I'm so impressed that during this really, we did it on the day before the conference um, in a, a three hour workshop. And we had really interesting things coming out that we were then also able to share at the conference. So to bring this work um, more to the attention of the other people that are generally more uh, just interested in citizen science. And Petra, who's asked a, a question in the chat, um, is also part of this working group. We've done this together. So, um, yeah, just a tiny example of how I try to interlink this. Okay, I just wrote down that I want to invite you for a zine making workshop. I think that sounds great. Um, Sele, do you also have an answer to the question how like um, intersectional feminist concepts directly influence your work? Yeah, actually, I think that a lot of the things that we are that I'm doing right now with my research and also with the work with Geo Chicas is, first of all, identifying those intersections that come and dialogue with us and try to see. Trying to see like this intersection, not as just mere concepts saying like, okay, this is a racial racialized person. And that encompasses all of the experiences of those kind of people, right? Racialized people only live this kind of experiences and this kind of discrimination and so on. LGBTQI people um, only experience this kind of, of discrimination or whatever. So what we're trying to do first is try to understand who's coming to us and who are we trying to reach out to. And also we have also there, I think someone's coming from the graduation or something and they're just like dancing. Um, something that for us has also been interesting is that we are seeing intersectionality based on specific and kind of unmovable categories, gender, um, race and ethnicity, geographic location, but a lot of the things that most people are not talking about right now is, for example, the language barrier for people to participate in this kind of discussions. Um, I'm talking about anti-colonialism, ways of producing knowledge, and here I am speaking in English, which is not, as you can all see, my native language. So, and I can say the same for the rest, or, or, or all of us, basically. Yes. I think that for none of us, English is our first language, right? And what are the things that we're trying to do in order to support the other people that, for example, Spanish speaking people wouldn't be able to participate here. And another example is that, for example, yeah, on the Open Knowledge Foundation Frictionless Data um, Fellowship I did, I asked them if we needed to post or publish a small article based on our on the progress of our work there. And I asked them, I really want to just like write this in Spanish because a lot of the people that would be really interested to know about this kind of methodologies and processes do not speak English. And I mean, practicing a little inconvenience, having a little uncomfortable thinking, it's one of the ways in which we have kind of understood other sides of other axes of intersection in our work. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is, um, I mean, that is like at the core intersectionality, right? That it, that it raises the awareness for the other dimensions. Um, so those are great examples. Um, we actually do because have- at the end, I think that's, sorry, just to wrap this up, at the end, privilege is, is the basic notion of not knowing and not realizing what others need. Yeah. Yeah. They just start knowing like and seeing all these other small little intersections that we're going to have like a more broader and robust way of working. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have two questions in the chat that ended up in the wrong chat, and for some reason we can't see the raised hands. So um, my apologies to the participants, but let's try to answer those two questions. The first one is uh, career advice. Um, what would you recommend to academics in short-term and part-time contracts that want to participate in feminist open science? Leave the castle? Um, that's a straightforward question that I know doesn't have a straightforward answer, but maybe one of you um, uh, is in, uh, wants to give some career advice. So if you're not set in academia yet, but if you want to participate in feminist open science, what should you do? I mean, I could maybe um, say something and, of course, uh, many things to say there, too. Um, I would say, no, uh, this is not something that's impossible to do on part time contracts. And um, obviously, one has to be careful that you don't end up having all your time taken over uh, by activities that are not well recognized. But I think the potential good news there is that we really are trying to change the system from the inside also. So more and more um, research institutions are using narrative CVs. Uh, there is real attention, I think, uh, now to the ways in which people actually collaborate um, in some open science initiatives and the experience they can bring from that, partly because institutions are really looking around, they're not quite sure what to do. Um, so actually spending time involved in feminist open science is not at all a waste of space when it comes to looking for an academic job at the moment. I really, I really do believe that. Um, and that actually ties also to the other question that was asked, which is what about a uh, single author versus multi-author um, um, situation, especially in social science. I'm very familiar with that. Uh, I hire a lot of people and what I'm involved in, they hire a lot of people. And it's true that there is this prejudice. Um, but again, I think we're looking at a moment where more and more is being recognized that uh, very often you can do excellent research work in a way that's collaborative and doesn't necessarily give rise to single authored outputs. Um, and again, the narrative CV helps in that respect uh, to kind of give you a space where you can explain uh, what you actually, what you actually done in participating in a certain network or what your contributions were. Um, I think um, what I would advise is to take any chance anybody has, whether it's a cover letter, whether it's adding paragraphs to a CV, whether it's qualifying um, publications, adding a little paragraph under each when you list them in your CV, where you really do spell out what you've been doing for that particular publication, what you were responsible for, what you feel your contributions were. And um, because I'm hoping we're in a moment where people are much better disposed to actually read those documents. Sometimes it's not so clear that people who are hiring uh, have formats that allow you to express this. But I would just say, take over, right? Just just use those spaces, make space uh, for those, that information, because I don't know, at least in the kind of committees I've been part of, uh, people are actually very interested in that information, even if they don't necessarily ask for it in the first place, which of course is a mistake. Yes, and I think particularly in that way, we're also seeing changes in hiring processes. We're, we're seeing some small pushes being made towards how um, uh, research evaluations happens, how hiring committees change, how funding distribution changes. And um, I'm, uh, after this conversation, very much afraid that all these ideas that on the surface look like they're more inclusive might have the new exclusionary um, practices built and baked into them. So we need to look at those carefully. But there's um, a, little, a little movement. Um, yes, yeah, so Sabina, you kind of uh, nested the second question in there, which is, um, a question to the panel, um, uh, what's your take on the idea that single authorship is better, um, a very common in elevation, evaluation of social sciences profiles? Um, I would like to, to pick this, this comment out uh, also one more time and may, maybe also put it to uh, Sele and, and Claudia. Is, there, are we f is, it, is this finally the end of the genius single author um, and collaboration is being recognized or is this still something that when you build your academic career from what you see is super important, the single authorship work. So you ask me directly? Or no, no. I, I feel, I, yeah, exactly. I feel like you already answered. I would ask Claudia and Sele if, if they also want to add to that question. Sorry for the confusion, Sabina. 
I don't think I have sufficient experience to to say that to say to that because um, my trajectory in academia is so niche and inside out and now you know I got from working with people at an I level to being a PhD student so I'm just discovering about this very hierarchical nature of science again that uh, somehow I like to ignore before so I, I what I see is that um, I think it is important but it's also changing but I can I'm really not access. Um, I just, uh, to the first question I would ask, I just wanted to add um, to um, to what Sabina has said. Um, I also believe that these feminist open science works and groups and networks, um, they're also an excellent place to build support networks that um, we need, especially when we are in more precarious situations of, uh, of employment. So this can also definitely be um, something to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are some great insights. And while we're in, um, Silly, do you want to add to that? I wanted to echo on what Claudia is saying. I'm also a PhD student, so I don't have enough experience on this. Although it gives me a lot of hope to think that the near future is going to be based on publishing in a collaborative way. Because, I mean, this, this, this entire conversation has been around ways in which we can support collaboration so for me yes hopefully that's going to be the end of single author because it's not only me but i know a lot of people that have had to go through a lot of institutional violence just based on the fact that they need to publish mm -hmm. and what they have to go through with like the most senior researcher publishing and everything that the more junior researchers have written and I mean, yeah, it's complicated, I think. Yeah. And I'm really sorry, I'm least I'm can't I can I can barely hear you or because this place just is really packed right now and I can't hear you. Okay. I mean, we're, we're about to nearing uh, the end of the conversation and um, uh, I think it still worked great. So on our end, we could hear you great. And there was no Mariah Carey interfering um, on, on this end. Um, the chat has yielded uh, some more amazing um, conversations, including the question of uh, how we can burn the castle in a way that afterwards a similar castle is not built again. I would like to not actually discuss that question um, um, but um, I think this is something to keep in mind that um, we also I think talked about when we build new infrastructures how can we make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes again um, so how can we um, um, advocate for for a sustainable change but um, uh, yes, people love zines, um, people love the narrative, uh, narrative CV, and um, they don't like the genius author. Um, so I think um, with that, maybe we can, we can close up for tonight. I think we covered a lot of ground. I'm uh, extremely amazed at the, um, the way in which you three managed to share with us the things that you have learned, your insights, your experiences, your practices, and um, I will maybe not attempt to, to, to do a summary um, other than maybe just underscoring that, um, that we need communities, cooperations, and that we need to work together and connect also on a very personal level if we want to make this happen. So I really do hope um, that we'll get a chance to, um, to see each other again and hopefully not just on a screen. Um, and um, yeah, with that, um, we, we can't have an audience that can applaud us. So I'm afraid we will have to applaud each other. And I um, highly suggest that we do that now um, because that was really um, a fun two hours. And yeah, with that, I hand back um, to um, Savina Garcia-Peter, who will close us out and tell us about the upcoming um, activities. <laughs>